Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. There are also a few seats in the front, and I know Susan loves when those seats are full. So please don't hesitate to move forward. My name is Stephen Boris. I'm the director, CEO of the Winnipeg Art Gallery. It's my pleasure to welcome you to a conversation with Dr. Susan A. Thompson. I wouldn't miss a Susan Thompson loving for anything. I'd like to acknowledge that the Winnipeg Art Gallery is located on the original lands of Anishinaabe, Anishinaabeg, Anishinaabeg, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We also acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. This afternoon, we will hear Susan Thompson share some personal, business, and hopefully some political stories. Through a conversation with Dr. Shannon Sampert, Perspective and polit Politics Editor at the Winnipeg Free Press. It's pretty special, historic, and a great honor to host the first and only female mayor in the 142-year history of our city, alongside the first woman to become editor of the op-ed pages in the 144-year history of the Winnipeg Free Press. This event is also timely as 2016 marks the 100th anniversary when Nellie McClung secured the vote for women in Manitoba. Elected mayor of Winnipeg in 1992, Susan Thompson was the first woman to own her family's business, the first woman Rotarian in Manitoba, the first woman Consul General at the Canadian Consulate in Minneapolis, the first woman and founding president and CEO of the University of Winnipeg Foundation, and the first woman to raise a million dollars and many more for the Winnipeg Art Gallery. This past year, Dr. Thompson was honored with the Order of Manitoba and an honorary Doctor of Laws from the University of Winnipeg. And most recently, as you I'm sure heard, the City Council voted unanimously to name the administration building at 510 Main Street after Susan Thompson. An amazing lead up. An amazing lead up to the 21st, 5th anniversary of her election as mayor to the city. Particularly pleased to have several members of the city council here with us this afternoon. The list of remarkable achievements go on and on. Just read her book. And it also includes the WAG and another legacy project. Since 1992, because Susan often reminds me, she has championed the Inuit Arts Center. And for the last, well, over two years, she has worked tirelessly as the executive consultant for the Capital Campaign. Canada's oldest civic art gallery, the WAG is home to the largest collection of contemporary Inuit art in the world. We're building an Inuit art center to celebrate and to honor the Inuit. It'll provide a pathway to cultural understanding as our community works towards reconciliation. The center will extend the WAG Studio and Learning Programs. Breaking ground next year, the Inuit Arts Center will bridge the country's north and south through exhibitions, research, programs, education, and art making. And I invite you all to learn more about this historic project for the display on the mezzanine level of the gallery. Susan has already contributed greatly to the Inuit Arts Center campaign with her time, energy, and vision and by your presence here this afternoon, you're also supporting this incredible project. As Susan generously asked that the net proceeds for today's event go towards the center's campaign. So thank you very much for your support. Today also highlights Susan's new memoir, Her Worship, Moments in History, Moments in Time, written with Terry Letien. The autobiography was launched in October and is already on McNally Robinson's bestseller list. For today's conversation on stage, Susan is joined by Dr. Shannon Sampert, the Perspective and Politics Editor at the Winnipeg Free Press. Currently on leave from the University of Winnipeg, Shannon has a PhD in Canadian politics and gender. She is the author of numerous journal publications 
and has co-edited the book Mediating Canadian Politics. So thank you, Shannon, for your participation today. After the conversation, there'll be a few minutes for questions from the audience, followed by a book signing and reception in the adjacent Eckhart Hall. Susan's book is available for purchase, and I urge you to get a copy because they're going fast. Today's event would not be possible without the generous support of several individual and corporate sponsors. Phil Burns, Marilyn Kamiklan, Alan Bev Rasimak, John Prostansky, Walter Silix, reception sponsors Banville and Jones, Cornelia Bean, Dessert Sensations, Cafe, G.J. Andrews, and Lilac Bakery, all favorite establishments of her worship. And of course, our media sponsor, the Winnipeg Free Press. A special thank you to the Winnipeg Art Gallery's associates for their help with coordinating today's event. I ask you all, if you could turn off your cell phones, thank you for coming out this afternoon and for your support. It's lovely to see you all here on a Grey Cup Sunday, no less. Impressive. Uh, and thanks so much for coming and joining us. It's going to be an in-conversation uh, with myself and Susan Thompson, and we are looking forward to hearing some insights into your book, but also some stories that maybe other people don't know about you that didn't quite make the book. Um, we like to think of it as a improved Peter Mansbridge in conversation. A much more Yay! feminized Peter Mansbridge <laughs> in conversation. The girl version. That's right, the much improved version. So we're going to start because uh, we have uh, lots to talk about and uh, afterwards we do invite you to ask questions uh, at the microphones as well. And I'm going to start with the big picture because that's why we're here is your very, very first day as mayor. Um, there are so many things that you can be proud of, and one of them, of course, is the fact that you were the first and only mayor in the Winnipeg history. Um, talk to me about what it was like that very first moment you realized you were going to be the mayor and going into work at that new place, City Hall. Well, it, it was, as all of you can Im imagine, it was uh, a part uh, unbelievable. Uh, we had worked very, very hard and, and pulled together what uh, I thought was the A-team uh, in terms of getting elected. Uh, so there was the, uh, the, in part, the disbelief. In part, the, yay, we did! <laughs> <laughs> and that we, we did, because, of course, as, as many of you will know, I, I was uh, uh, portrayed that I wouldn't stand a chance on uh, actually winning and uh, and then, as it all sunk in, when I did win, it was the enormous responsibility. Right. Yeah, because yeah. Winnipeg was a very different city when you became mayor. We were in very tough times. Yeah. We had, uh, 1992, we had the uh, highest property taxes in Canada. We had the highest per capita debt as a city. We were the murder capital. We had come through the 80s. Many of you will remember the 21% interest rates. I know today for the younger people in the audience, hard to believe, but the interest rates were 21% in, in the uh, early 80s. And then we, there were two recessions in the 80s. We came into the 90s. We had had a big fiasco in 1991 on uh, reassessment of, of uh, city assessment. And so it was a very, very tough time. And it really required... Uh, the attitude to get in there and roll up your sleeves and get the job done because we had some big problems. And so you rolled up your sleeve and you got things done, but it wasn't exactly straightforward and like on a, on a curve like that. It was up and down. And Do I still have the look of terror yeah. in my face? <laughs> well, there were some moments, weren't there? Oh, no, no, no. There were moments, several moments every day. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I was in office uh, six years, and every, every day was a, a tremendous challenger. We've got uh, city councillors in the, the audience uh, today, and uh, for the, the women city councillors, 
in particular, it, uh, it is still a huge challenge uh, to be a, a leader as women in the cultures that one faces in political life. I'm happy to see, though, uh, Devi Sharma, the speaker, uh, Jazz, actually got uh, uh, worked very hard behind the scenes, and your name is now going to be on the administration building. And that's congratulations, Devi, on the hard work on that, <laughs> having City Council pass that. What a, what a lovely way to honor you and, and to see that on the City Hall administration building. What was your sense when, uh, when you got the call saying they approved it and they said yes? Was, was it positive? Was it better sweet? Was it... Was it? Uh, well, Councillor uh, Sharma had started this initiative uh, many, many months ago. Right. And, uh, and then as it e evolved, uh, that, well, when she first called me, I'd, I'd, uh, <laughs> I, I had I'd been quite adamant that I didn't want anything named after me. I, when I left City Hall, I left City Hall. And, uh, but as she spoke to me, uh, and then as the mayor uh, uh, had conversations with me, I made it quite clear that I would be most honored to have my name on the building with the understanding that it was to be done to honor all women of Winnipeg who had come before me and have come after me. This may have my name, but it's to honor the women of Winnipeg who have come before me and after me. Well, it's lovely, too. It's happening in the year of our 100th anniversary of women in Manitoba Timely. getting the vote. Fabulous, uh, fabulous time uh, for us to be sitting on the stage here as well and speaking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about then that first, uh, that, that job that you had the very first day as, a, as the mayor of, of, this, of the city of Winnipeg. How did you deal with the stress of it all, uh, the craziness, the demands of the job. You are a, you're a single woman, so there wasn't anybody to help you sort of at home. How did you, how did you manage it all? I'll, if I may, yeah. I'll, I'll try to break this down in, into uh, parts. Mm -hmm. Be, because the, you know, how do you handle something where you, you've come in brand new and you have no relationships with anybody. You don't have relationships with media, with counselors, with administration, with the unions. The, the, the group that you have the biggest relationship with are the citizens. Right. That, that's, that's who you are, are, are there to, to represent. So I was uh, completely naive, completely naive as to how bureaucracies work and how the system worked. And so I was, uh, I was starting from about 10 steps back. And uh, when I got into uh, office, I got into City Hall, and the actual physical feeling of walking into that building was things almost, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite sincere about this. I walked in the front door, and it was sort of like everything was slowing down. Wow. And yet we were at such an urgent time when things had to be changing quite quickly. Mm -hmm. and, and when I got into the mayor's office, the, the mayor's staff had been staffed with Steve Juba, with Mayor Steen, with Mayor Nori, and, and here I was. I hadn't been a city councillor. Nobody knew me. They didn't know me. So I had staff that didn't know me. I didn't know them. And then I had councillors. So, so it was just a whole new world. And, uh, and I found within the first week between being the, the target of criticism, you, you go from running for public office and wanting to do your very best for all of you. And you run a campaign that says, here's what I'm going to try to do for you, for my city. And you get into the office and all of a sudden it's, you know, you're, you're the subject of terrible criticism. Yeah. And that, that plays on you. And within the first week, I would get up in the morning, I would get ready, I would get into to my Volkswagen Passat, I'd get onto Grosvenor, and all of a sudden my jaw would lock, I would have chest pains, and I would get into City Hall, and the very first thing I always wanted to do was say good morning to the, the mayor's office staff because 
trust me, the political, and by political I mean the, the staff that serve the councillors and, and the mayor, do an unbelievable job for everybody. And uh, so I would like to go in and say good morning to them every morning. But by the time I got to City Hall, it, the stress would be so bad I would be going in and saying, good morning, how are you? You know, how is everything? Because my jaw would be locked. And the chest pains would just be terrible. But you'd already been woken up, what you were telling me, oh. at, at 5.30 in the morning. Roger by... Curry somehow had my phone number. And it was the days before uh, call display. And, uh, and, and so, you know, when your phone rings, and very few people have your, your number, because one of the first things you have to do is get an unlisted number. <laughs> you do not want to be in the phone book when you're a public official. And uh, no, you don't. And, uh, and all of a sudden, you know, it's 5.30 in the morning, and there's this Roger Curry on CJOB going, good morning, Your Worship. And I'd go, well, that's a nice voice. <laughs> and uh, okay, this is what's hit the news, and, you know, I'll be phoning you at 6 o'clock and, uh, and be ready. So, you know. There would be several times a week when wow. that's how you started your day and, and you end your day at 11 o'clock after you've done a function. Or, well, um, yes, yeah, so the stress, um, I didn't manage very well until it became very serious and then I had to do something. There's a 10-second rule. Did that help you? Yes. We, uh, when, when you're in public life, you are the target of, of uh, criticism, misinformation, smears, name it. And uh, so I, I found that when I got in in the mornings, I, I got to the stage I couldn't read the paper, I, I just, and I couldn't listen to the news. Don't take that. Don't take that. Yeah, 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 yeah. We want you to read the yeah, paper. Yeah, yeah. Just not when you're mayor. Yeah, yeah, yeah right, right. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, and so I would get into the office, and usually the the chief of staff, because we developed a process, and and really this this applies to everybody's life, your life and my life. You have to develop a process when you are faced with extraordinary circumstances. And so I said, okay, fine, we're, we're going to have the 10-second rule. And what it was was I would come in, and my chief of staff and, and maybe one other staff person would be there. And I'd say, okay, okay, what am I going to get hit with today? And it would be yada, yada, yada. And if it was grossly unfair in our opinion, in my opinion, then I was allowed to swear for 10 seconds. <laughs> but only with darn and one other word. <laughs> if it was personally vicious or hurtful, then it required a cry. And, but that could only be for 10 seconds because you learned that you, you had to experience the emotion, and you had to get it out, and about it, it was only worth 10 seconds, and then you had to have a cry or, or whatever it was, so we, had, we, we supported the Kleenex company, <laughs> and, and then it was, can we do anything about it? And if we could do something about it, then an action plan. And if we couldn't do anything about it, I had to learn how to let it go. Right. And everybody here today has had that said to them, let it go. It is a skill set that has to be learned. It's not a phrase and it is not a saying. It is a skill set that you have to learn in life to let, let it, it go. go. And it's a tough one to learn and it takes a lot of discipline and, uh, and I had to learn to let it go because we had, uh, we, you know, my, my two terms in office were highly urgent. Right. And, and we had to get on with the, the business of the city. So right now we have what's going on in Alberta with the MLA, uh, Sandra Jansen. That's right. Yes, Sandra Jansen. She was running as a Tory uh, for the Tory political leader and uh, received such horrible texts and, and uh, stuff on social media and, and actually was, you know, the, the C word was put on her posters at, at party meetings. She's jumped now. She's gone to the NDP. It's a little, it's even worse now, it seems, than it was before We've, with rape threats on, on, on social media. How does your heart feel when you hear that? What's your advice to women that are, that are experiencing that kind of, kind of it's torture? It's very devastating and it's 
Um, uh, I think my number one comment is, it's got to stop. Um, and, and, and I am uh, extremely troubled. Right. Like, uh, I would say all of us are, just not women. But this, this, this whole behavior is, it's got to stop. We, we talk in schools about stopping bullying. But this whole culture and language that is going on and is being directed towards women has got to stop. And I really, when, when this happened to her, because uh, it, it happens to all of us, you just don't get to hear about it, okay? Mm-hmm. When we in public life get death threats, which are very serious, we cannot talk about it. You do not hear about it. But we have to deal with it. When you get this kind of uh, horrible situation and language and behavior, it, uh, it has to be talked about now. And, and one of the questions I've been asked in the past couple of days is, is how do we deal with this? Well, it, it has to come from all of us. But from my perspective today, one of the most important things is I need the men to stand up. Yeah. I need the men. Thank you. Yeah, I, no, 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 let me finish. There isn't a woman in this room yeah. that hasn't tried to fight the sexism or the misogyny or the unacceptable behavior. Every woman in this room and in our society has tried to do it. But we need the men to stand up for us. I am so proud that we have a prime minister who stood up and said, I'm a feminist. I went, say what? I am 69 years old. I have never in all my careers heard a man stand up and say, I'm a feminist. And I went, okay. That's a game changer. It is a game game changer. changer. But what comes with this change, there has to be a wave now of the men standing up and saying, you cannot behave like this, you cannot talk like this, this is not tolerated language in our home, this is not tolerated language between us as partners, this is not tolerated language in the workplace, this is not tolerated in our society. We are a civilized society. We are Canadians. We are good people. And we absolutely need this. We need to hear from the men. Oh, excellent. Is my opinion. Thank God. I, I would totally agree with you. Um, you know, what's really interesting is to watch what's happening in the United States uh, compared to Canada. This kind of rude discourse, the, the, the rhetoric, the, you know, the horrible things that uh, President-elect Trump has said about women, about uh, Mexicans, etc. You know, when I was in Cleveland and, uh, and New Orleans and Washington covering the election for the free press, meeting with all sorts of people uh, to see what they thought about the election, you know, no one that I talked to believed that Trump was going to win, including Trump himself. I including actually, me. Yeah, exactly. Um, so was it kind of deja vu to watch what uh, Hillary Clinton had to sort of put up with in terms of uh, the negative, the nastiness, the brutal brutal attacks that she, that she persevered? Was that sort of the same for you at times? Oh, there isn't a, a, a woman in any leadership role that has not experienced this. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm just, it's okay. I'm 69 now, soon to be 70. So, you know, I'm an elder. I can say all these things. It's time to stop. No, it's time to stop. This, right. We are a civilized society. We have to act accordingly. When I first went into City Hall, it was, a, um, it, it was like colliding planets. It was the uh, uh, administration against the elected officials. It was the unions against the administration and the elected officials. It was the councillors against the mayor. It was uh, the media against... It, it was colliding planets. I've never seen such a dysfunctional situation. And I went... And, and city council had 10% approval rate when I uh, became mayor. 10% approval rate from the citizens. And I went, this, no, we have to develop a process right. and, and make things work. 
You elect us to make things work, and you elect us to deliver to you. And we cannot go in as public officials and think it's all about us. It's not. It's all about you. It's all about our citizens. It's about our city and how we serve you. So we have to work out a process to make that work. And so after, you know, stepping on every darn landmine there ever was in the first week, I mean, I only have to be taught that lesson once. And I went, no, 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 we've got to come into process. So Councillor Prostansky is here, and as he knows, I set up a, a process whereby Executive Policy Committee were the leadership core of, of the city. We had to have the opportunity to meet privately to discuss how are we going to handle certain initiatives? I had to hear your perspectives as mayor. I had to know what you were thinking. Were you going to support this recommendation or not? And then I set up a process for council seminars so that, you know, because there was always, oh, it's the mayor and an executive policy committee and they're the elites and, you know, bunk. They're the leadership group. And then, but what you had to do was to have a process of council seminars so that everybody was together to hear the information, to give their feedback, so that when we presented to you the citizens, we looked like a professional leadership group which would deliver the results you expected. And so I, I immediately, for my, for survival, had to go to process. And, and try to get that to work. But that was not an easy thing. I mean, you basically were told, you're supposed to smile and just take it. You're just one vote. That's right. I was a pretty smile with no substance. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're pretty sunshiny, but I sense that there's some steel wool there as well. Uh, oh, yeah. there's... Um, uh, public life, uh, again, uh, that's a whole... A whole game changer. But yeah, no, you're absolutely right. You, if, if you're going to, and, and I think this holds true if you're in any organization, corporation, uh, the, what, whatever circumstances you're in. If, if you're in the media, you know, your world, you have to, if you are in there to affect change mm -hmm. and to get the job done, you have to have a, a real sense of uh, duty, responsibility, perseverance, resilience, uh, a very deep core in the belief of what you're doing is important. Right. Uh, and, and then you, in, in my case, I completely underestimated the um, importance that certain people put into who they were Ooh. and that they controlled. I, I mean, I, I had everybody tell me that they ran the city and, and I didn't. I, I was the only one elected by all of the citizens. Right. Councillors are elected by ward. And uh, yet I was told more times than you would ever want to know that I only had one vote on council and that I was new to council and council had already decided how the votes were going to go. Hmm. And then I had the senior administration tell me, well, they really controlled the votes. And so uh, things were going to run according to how they said it should work. Right, John? <laughs> and uh, then the unions also told me that they controlled everything. So everybody controlled everything but me. But you, I was, and you were just sort of I was just smile. Man, yeah. yeah, exactly. But you talk really fondly of some of the relationships you've built at City Hall as well. There were some people that oh. you got to work with that you thought, I think, are on the list of favorites. And favorite well, stories, it, yes. You know, it, 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 you in public life, you are justifiably paranoid because people really are out to get you. <laughs> you know, I mean, you you find yourself paranoid. Oh gosh, that person's really trying to chew me up and spit me out. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are. It, it's it's a it's it's a reality, but. Then you, you have to, you have this, there's a switch in your head here, okay? It's right here. And that switch, when you are faced with adversity, either the fear just builds up on you and you, the switch either goes to victim and then you spend the rest of your life living in fear and being a victim. 
or the switch goes over to survivor, and you get mad, and you decide, damn the torpedoes, some famous woman might have just... Mm -hmm might have said a few years ago. And you go, no, I'm going to get the job done. So I decided that there were 30 department heads, 28 were white and male, one was a woman and, and one was a man of color who headed a department. So there was one woman out of 30 department heads and I went, oh no, we're not going to have this. And uh, so I sat down with the uh, senior administration and said, why, why, why do we have this? I said, we've got women in this city that are MBAs, PhDs, highly accomplished. And the answer back was, uh, but they don't have the experience. <laughs> I went, no kidding. You know, 28 <laughs> out of 30. I, I, I mean, it's, it's the dominance rule. Yeah. So we're going to become, the word is proactive, and we're going to give equality and opportunity. That's what we're going to do, because we're the city government. And we represent all the people. So we're going to start putting in more diversity and opportunity and equality and things like this. So by the time I finished being mayor, the majority of department heads were women. And um, I love the younger generation here. They have girl power. Girl power. We yeah. have girl power. Yay. 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 Exactly. <laughs> Fantastic. But it was, okay, come on, we, we have to have fairness of leadership right. and, yes, and some wonderful relationships. And, and even by the second term, it's interesting, again, for, to, to see how political life works because, of course, it's so dominated by power. And when you get power, you cannot become corrupt and you cannot become entitled and you cannot become arrogant. But it happens. And so one of the most important things that, that I tried to, to affect was to make sure that we stayed focused on serving Winnipeg. And it, in the first year, the, the first year of council, um, one of the councillors came up to me and said, uh, Madam Mayor, how many votes did you win in your first year? And I went, oh, I how would I know? I'm just lucky that I'm still alive. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, um, well, you've, you've only won three votes in the entire year. And I said, uh, oh. And, uh, and I said, but, you know, sometimes you have to lose in order to win. And I'm trying to affect change here. Right. And I'm quite prepared to, to lose in order to, to win. And he, I said, because what I'm trying to do is right. And he said, well, Madam Mayor, in the political world, you're dead right. Wow. Nice. <laughs> Shot across the bow again. So I went, okay, fine. So it wasn't until I got reelected that it was fascinating to see the political body actually physically and verbally come to me and say, all right, you just got reelected. You now have the power. <laughs> what was the last four years? Just fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. No, but it but it was interesting because it was their statement of respect, right? Uh, I guess, or or shock and awe that I'd survived because they they one of my city councillors again in my first year came to me and said, "You do know there's a bet on uh, that we're going to get rid of you before your first year," and I went. You, nice. you know, again, what is wrong with your heads that you don't understand that we're here to serve the citizens? You know, stop this infighting and this power play yeah. and all the stupidness that goes on. And I said, I beg your pardon? And he said, oh, yeah, the unions and the senior administration and the counselors all have a bet on that they're going to make your life so miserable that you'll quit. Well, you didn't, obviously. No. Stayed on for two. Good for you. Yes. yes. <laughs> exactly. I would, just, I would just put my head under a pillow and cry for more than 10 seconds. 
So you stopped serving the people of Winnipeg and you served, started serving Canada as the Consul General in Minneapolis. And so just before the curtain went up, you said to me that one of the things you found most interesting was that you went in believing we were absolutely the same and you recognize ain't no way that we're the same as the United States. So the great, talk to me about that. Well, the great Canadian mistake. I, I don't know how, how I didn't understand this, but, you know, I had relatives who were American and friends, and, you know, we're so close, and we, all of this, and I, and I just went, well, you know, the, Ameri the Americans are just like us. <laughs> <laughs> the Canadians set a good example. And in actual fact, when I got down to the, the United States, it, uh, boy, the learning curve was, uh, you know, when you see how the political system, sure. and, and I, I want you to share with people, because, of course, you, yeah. were, you were there for this most recent election, but you get down there and you get to see the, the power and the wealth and the cultural difference between us yeah. is so huge. And, you know, often when I was speaking to American audiences, I would say, you know, you talk about uh, the great United States of America, and you are great, but it's, it's all this rhetoric of how big you are and how powerful you are, and you're the world leader, and you're this and you're that. But what it doesn't often uh, open up to is partnerships. You know, no, no, we're the biggest, we're the most powerful. Well, you know, like this. So, you know, if you were ever in uh, our Canadian government in the NAFTA negotiations or the free trade agreement, well, yeah. you know, you don't, it's rough. It's real yeah. rough. And the culture is we're the most important, we're biggest, yeah. and we're... Well, and the system is absolutely broken when you, when you realize it took $6.5 billion to get a president elected. Yeah. There's nobody out here who ever oh. will be able to be you know, the president at that rate. $100,000, $120,000 to run for commissioner. Yeah. And that's like, that's, it's more than what MLA or MP would ever pay to, to run a campaign. So it just takes a little guy out. There's, I think in Canada, we're more inclusive in who can actually run, even though it is limited as well uh, yeah. in other ways. So you were down there. You covered uh, the election. You yeah. covered it in Washington, D.C., in, Penn in Philadelphia. Louisiana and Cleveland, yeah. yeah. So share, what, what was your take on the whole? <laughs> We're going to be here till four o'clock. Forget the prosecco. <laughs> we'll bring it in. <laughs> it was um, like I said. No one, uh, no one expected him to win. Uh, the people that I met with were pundits, uh, journalists, uh, pollsters, uh, activists. And I think the most telling moment for me was when I went on down into the Lower Nine in uh, Louisiana. It was an area that's very, very impoverished, and um, it was the area most hit by the by the, the hurricane. And there were buildings that were still up that had the sign, the hurricane markings on it to let you know what time it was entered, how many dead people they were, that kind of thing. So those buildings were still up. They hadn't been taken down yet. Um, there were lots that still had, um, that the, the, the houses had been taken off of. The city had sent out a, a warning to one lot owner because they wanted the lot for themselves, that if they didn't maintain it, they would lose the lot. So at 8 o'clock at night on a Friday, the dusk is falling, it's warm, and you see these lovely women mowing the lawn to a lot that doesn't have a house on it anymore because she's still trying to maintain the lot because she doesn't want to lose it. And, of course, the insurance, 10 years later, has still not settled with her. It is a system that is broken, ladies and gentlemen. It's a system that's broken. There's no other, no other way to put it. And my heart broke. But it was, a, you know, it was... A, 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 Everybody is so optimistic in the United States, too. It's kind of like yeah. living in Calgary. <laughs> so, so, you know, there's kind of the, the highs and the lows, and it's very, very interesting. And I think we're getting sort of to the point where we're almost near the end, uh, and we're going to go to the floor. But before we go to the floor for questions, Susan, I want you to tell me what you think we can do as women from here? Where do we go from here? What do we do to see our numbers increase in positions of power, to see more women in the boardroom, to see more women in business? What do you think we can do next? Well, I think the, the most important thing is to acknowledge the fact that uh, things can go backwards real quick. And I think the Absolutely. fact that uh, of what just happened in the United States, you, you want to see society go backwards real quick? That's my opinion. 
and uh, Mr. Trump, don't sue me. It's my opinion that American society has gone backwards. Yeah. So for women, this is a, a call to action. This is a wake-up call. There have, have been uh, tremendous strides, but we are still only 26% of uh, MPs in, in Parliament, 6% on corporate boards, etc. Call to action. Women have got to take this stronger and further, and I know that you've got some, you've got uh, several initiatives that people need to know about. Yeah. yeah, one of the things for sure that we're looking at is uh, we're trying to organize uh, some, uh, some uh, very strong words for the Bank of Canada, uh, which has snubbed our lovely Nellie McClung. So for those of you who are thinking that she should have rightfully been put on the banknote, please contact your member of parliament to let them know that you're not happy with the choice. And while you're at it, contact all the members of parliament for both Manitoba and Alberta, because Nelly belongs to both of these provinces. The other thing I'm really happy is that we're going to have an unveiling on Tuesday of the Nelly McClung plaque at the Manitoba Legislature. We're really, really happy about that. And for those of you who are interested, we're trying to organize a Canadian Manitoba chapter for the Million Women March on Washington. And we're going to try and get some women to Washington uh, the day after the presidential election, uh, the presidential swearing in, just to remind Mr. Trump that we're not going anywhere anytime soon. And you may think that that is normal talk uh, behind closed doors, and we're here to tell you it ain't. But we do have microphones here. Oh, can I just... I'm I, sorry, go ahead. I do a lot of homework for these. Uh, <laughs> I, I really do. I come with files of research I have done, and I, I think I've probably emailed almost everybody in this room what you want to hear, etc. But one of the uh, uh, pieces of research that I came across that I, I think, because people will always say to me, you know, how, how do women move forward? So here is a piece that Patricia Curit uh, from BC uh, wrote, and it's called The Path uh, to Leadership for Women. And she says, it starts with picking the right organization or company with a culture that promotes diversity and opportunity for all. That was her first criteria. Next, the path is complex for anyone and more so for women. Women need to stretch beyond their comfort zone. That's amazing. Develop that next level of skill set. And here she puts in brackets. I always took a job I needed to develop in and I went, me too. <laughs> I always... Every job that I, or career, or, or path I went on, I needed to develop into that job. I didn't go into that job completely qualified or experienced in whichever. But, as she said, she had the self-confidence that she would learn. And that's what I've always felt. I, I can learn, and I can learn how to do this. Take intellectual risks right. and then develop mentors. My goodness me, have I been blessed with mentors. The number of men and women that have mentored me, I apologize to you all. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it says, and find a work-life integration all the while while developing your leadership skills. Well, I've failed terribly at that. I don't have any balance at all. I have missions. <laughs> I have passions to achieve. I have no balance. But you're supposed to. And the journey to leadership is challenging. I always love it. One of my uh, skill sets I've developed is perseverance. And don't some of you in this room wish that I didn't have it. <laughs> but I persevere forever and until I get the job done. And uh, so... You know, life is a challenge, and most people give up far too soon. I, I love this word, whatever. I don't know what that word means. It just doesn't whatever. exist. And most people do give up far too soon. Mm -hmm. No, you don't give up. You just go to plan B, and if plan B doesn't work, then you go to plan C, and if plan C doesn't work, you just persevere. And it's all about realizing your potential. So that's the path to leadership. I would add to that. The one thing I would add to that is that if you're waiting for the day that you have confidence, you're going to wait yes. too long. I think that what women need to recognize is when in doubt, act as if. 
When in doubt, act as if you have the right to be in the room, even though everybody says you don't. When in doubt, when people think that you can't do it, act as if you can. And the best thing in the world is uh, living well is the best revenge. And having a good, balanced life and a wonderful career is a great revenge. But those microphones are open. We're really dying to hear from you. Ask some questions. Feel free. Uh, pop on up. And uh, Susan will be more than glad to entertain. We'll go to this, uh, this side here first. Go ahead. A young lady from, uh, go ahead. Hi. Um, what suggestions would you have for a young woman like considering public life? Well, first of all, do it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and prepare yourself. So, you know, if you're, here, here's how you, you go about it, it, and it applies to everything. Um, if you're considering going into public life, and, and the many city councillors that are here uh, today, and, and I think we have a couple of MLAs here too, you do not even think about going into public life unless you have a passion for it. If you don't, in your heart and soul, love your city or love your province or love your country, don't you even think about going into public life because you have to have a passion that will see you through the difficult, darkest, and deep times. So you have to have that passion. And then it's like everything else. You have to build a good team. You have to build a good support system. You have to do your research. And you really have to understand the culture that you're going into. So you, it's, it's like everything else. Build a plan. Go, you know, seriously, the, 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 people who know me know that I'm fearless. And what I mean by when I say I'm fearless is because if I think it's important that I need to talk to you, then I will pick up the phone or I will go and visit you because for some reason I feel I must talk to you. And it's just priceless when people would say to me, who, who did you call? <laughs> and when I was prime minister, I, 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 when I was, that's a Freudian slip. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> well, there we go. <laughs> when I was mayor, I thought I should be the prime minister. And as people know, I didn't belong to a political party. But I thought that the majority of citizens in Canada live in cities. And therefore, you needed to know your premiers and you needed to know the prime minister. And so I said to my scheduler, who, God bless her, and I said, I, would you get me an appointment with Prime Minister Kachian? <laughs> she said, really? And I said, well, yes, I'd like to meet him. And uh, so she said, okay. And then she, uh, it was a few days later, she comes back into my office and she says, well, you know, the Prime Minister's office would like to know what you want to talk to him about. <laughs> and I said, oh, well, yes. Well, I want to talk to him about the Pan American Games because we, you know, we had just won the Canadian bid and we were quite optimistic that we would win the, uh, the big bid and yada, yada, yada. So I want to talk to him about the, the Pan American Games. And, they, they, well, you know, of course I wanted to do all that. But I wanted to meet him. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so it's um, develop your intestinal fortitude, develop your uh, resilience, uh, develop your acumen, be very astute, and you better possess 200% of common sense. How's that? Thank you. Thank you for a very informative presentation today and discussion. It's been fun to listen to you. I'm wondering, uh, what do you think is your greatest legacy in the two terms of your office as mayor to Winnipeg? Changing the culture, breaking that grass, glass ceiling. I mean, uh, well, I'm 25 years out, and I'm still the one, the, the one and only, so it's going to take more work. But uh, the greatest contribution was to say yes uh, women can hold the highest office in the city. Yes, women uh, can be leaders in our city. And uh, come on, we need more. 
It's a good answer. How about your second legacy? <laughs> I just didn't hear it. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I, 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 besides the, the leadership as a woman, I'm also interested here in, in Winnipeg, uh, what is another uh, legacy that we can uh, see from Mayor Susan Thompson? Part of our history. Hmm. That's a, that's a good, uh, good question. Legacy. Pan Am Games were great. That was... I'm sorry? The Pan Am great games were great contribution. To yeah, me. I appreciate that. And, and you know, but it, it's, it's all a team effort. And, uh, you know, when, when I, I think about specifically, I, I, I mean, I always, it's, a, it's as Stephen Boris uh, said, you know, when, when I was brought into this art gallery and shown this uh, world-class collection, that we have here. As mayor of the city, my job was to, what can put us on the map? What can bring more investment to the city? What can make us proud? What can we honor? All of, all of these kinds of things. So I looked for opportunities such as this Inuit Art Center. It's taken a bit longer, to, <laughs> but you know, and the Pan American Games and the World Junior Hockey and all of that. I, I just saw that we had, uh, a citizenry of volunteers that was uh, above and beyond any city in Canada. And I sincerely mean that. Look at this Grey Cup in Toronto yet again. Mm -hmm. Why would you have a... Oh, jeez, I'm sorry. This is... Mm -hmm. very <laughs> Why would you hold a Grey Cup in Toronto? Seriously. So I, I have to answer the question to you by saying... Uh, changing a culture and all the subcategories of that were huge. Um, bringing in uh, events and, and things like that was me having the common sense to go, what is one of the greatest assets in Winnipeg and it's our volunteerism and how our citizens contribute to making our city so special and such a great place. So I'm just going to exploit that and, you know, bring as many events and, and things like that as I can. I have to maybe, uh, to try to give you an answer, I would have to, to say that I hope that my leadership during the flood was... Um, thank you. Thank you. It's the things we couldn't tell you. We were up against all odds. I, I, I'm sure everybody knew that the volume of water that was coming at us was unprecedented. So when you're the mayor and you get the briefings and you're told that it is going to be the biggest flood of the century, that you have uh, this wall of water of 24 and a half feet coming at you, and uh, that uh, the floodgates should hold... Should. <laughs> that the pumping stations have only been attested to 19 and a half feet. And what you all need to know about the pumping stations is if they shut down, they shut down, the flaps go like this. And so you have a shutdown of the pumping stations, which then puts six and a half feet of sewer water into 100,000 homes like that. So the, all of a sudden you have an, uh, another, we, we would call it the enemy. The water was the enemy. So there was the overland flooding, the water volume, the pumping stations, the sandbags, the dikes were getting saturated. We, our, our forecasts were to worst case scenario. We had two feet of freeboard. Uh, if we had a snowstorm, if we had a rainstorm, then all of, you know, it, it, all of the options and possibilities were terrifying. <laughs> Yet I had to go with my team from city council, the current CAO, Doug McNeil, was my chief engineer, and I had to go with a team to try to share with all of you the best information we had, but not to create panic, to create a confidence in you that we were absolutely doing our best, but we could not talk about the scenarios that we were and might have happened. Scary. So... You know, it was to try and give you leadership in a crisis that... Uh, Great that thorough I... answer. Thank you. We'll take this question. I think this is going to have to be the last one, though, unfortunately. But I Sorry, will leave, I'll leave you up to bat, the, bat it out of the park. How's that? I have a question, I have a question about um, process. 
Uh, what do you think of the new process of people applying to be senators rather than people being appointed? Great, I applied. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, when it was, you know, nonpartisan, well, you know, I, I mean, I, it was priceless with the media because I had, uh, uh, in my first term, I was Brian Mulroney of Winnipeg. In my second term, I was the John Chrétien of Winnipeg. <laughs> Go figure. Anyway, but I truly supported the person, et cetera. So I was delighted to see that it, that what I thought w was progress. Um, so I applied. And I thought, great, because Canadians have been asked to, you know, if you want to make things better, get in there. And uh, the fact that um, I uh, applied as a senator from Manitoba but didn't live here and I didn't have $4,000 worth of property, <laughs> which was two of the criteria, it didn't matter. I still thought I had something that I could contribute to the Senate. So to answer your question, I thought the process was very good. And I was delighted to apply. That's great. Thank you. So um, that concludes the conversation. I think yes. Stephen wants to come up and... St uh, St can and I just take sh one more minute? Sure. Because I'd like, to, I'd, like, I'd like to leave you with something. Um, I, I have never lost my deep belief in the art of the possible. I happen to think that everything is possible. I believe in dreaming. I believe in doing visioning exercises. And I was so delighted um, when I, uh, a couple of years ago, I was given this book. And it's my dream book. And it has a quote on it from Vincent van Gogh. And it says, looking at the stars always makes me dream. And I thought, we need to hear these nurturing things. And so then the next day I was reading the newspaper, and there was a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt that I would like to end with. The future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. Thank you, Susan and Shannon, for a truly riveting conversation. I think we've all left inspired, but also thinking and rethinking our roles, our responsibilities, and our rights as women and men in our society. Before you head into Eckhart Hall, there will be a book signing there. I remind you, and I know sure. Susan would appreciate this. There's a 15% discount at the shop. Yes. There is um, complimentary gift wrapping. Yes. Go buy your Christmas. I, it was an honor to sit with Councillors Luke, Mays, Morantz, and Sharma. I think it's appropriate that the city council is represented here. When I hired Susan as my executive, a consultant for the Inuit Arts Center campaign, I knew I was getting one of the best connected and seasoned fundraisers in the city and across the country. She is delivered, but what I had not expected was that I would be getting a mentor, a coach, and a friend with a built-in moral compass. And yes, it is true. With Susan, we have raised millions for this city and for a life-changing project. In fact, once we have one more key supporter recommitted, we'll have raised over $53 million here, here. for the Inuit Arts Center. <laughs> but for Susan, it was not always about the money. For her, it was also about raising awareness of a local, regional, national, international initiative that leads to reconciliation. Worldwide, some of you may know the four most admired and sought after characteristics of a complete leader. And they are being honest, forward looking, 
competent, and inspiring. There's no question from what we heard today and what we've read, we see those four characteristics in her worship. Of those four, the most valued characteristic is honesty. And Susan has taught me and my team a great deal about honesty. But she's also helped us understand the importance of leading by values rather than reputation. And in preparing for today's conversation, I just wanted to leave you with a few choice chestnuts or gems from the lexicon of Susan Thompson. But rather than going to her recently published autobiography, I went to my email box (laughs) and I discovered a wealth of bolded, all-cap words, phrases, one-liners that remind me of the great leader we've been working with here at the WAG over the last few years. So please allow me to close this conversation with Susan Thompson on and off the cuff. And in no particular order, because they appear over and over. (laughs) Keep in mind, some of these relate to the Inuit Arts Center project. This appeared more than any other, onward and upward. We have a liftoff. Hard work and perseverance does pay off. Success is in the details. Woohoo! Good on you! We're on a roll. We do indeed have a hit. We actually have a campaign, and I remember the day she said that. We have to build a relationship with them first, just as long as someone does it. I truly am doing everything I can to get publicity. My hope is to put this to bed as soon as possible. I hate duplication and overlap. All feedback is appreciated, but just keep me in the loop. There's always pockets of money. If I have a scotch, then you deserve at least a triple. (laughs) You need to recharge, yada, yada, yada. I know I must sound like a mother, but I prefer elder. (laughs) And a few key ones for what is truly a national initiative. This is truly... Well, this is the words of Susan Thompson. This is truly a global project and will serve all constituencies very, very well. It'll stand our city, our province, and our country in good stead. It'll be a tremendous legacy. Susan wrote in the last few months, it is my pleasure to inspire and help where I can. I hope you're feeling proud. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be part of it. And the day after we launched that amazing Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce luncheon, sold out, organized largely by Susan. She wrote me a note, and it was personal, but you know, it applied to every member of my team. She said, you embraced this project, you have evolved it in in what it was meant to be, you have captured its essence, and today you gave it its future. Am I missing anything? She'd often close. No, Susan, you never miss a thing, but we're missing you.